Today we're going to do the particle model of matter topic. So this is going to be for combined science. There'll be an extra video with the triple only sections on it later. First off, we're going to look at density. So you need to know this is part of your GCSE maths as well. So it may be a little bit familiar to you. So density is referring to how closely packed together a, a substance is, how closely packed of a, are the particles together to each other. So a denser object means the particles are packed in very, very close to each other. So the equation for density would be mass divided by volume. So mass has always got to be in kilograms. Volume would be in meters cubed unless they're giving it to you in something else. But what would that be um, for density? Well, that would be kilograms per meter cubed per meter cubed, kilograms per meter cubed. So density, we tend to use this symbol here. So it looks like curly P, and that's called rho. That's density rho. M for mass, V for volume. So before we go into the required practical for density, first of all, let's remind ourselves of some key stage three stuff, but some extra stuff that we need to know um, to take this to GCSE level. And that's our state of matter, our solid liquids and our gases. So the key thing is when we talk about these State, different states of matter, we need to be talking about the forces of attraction between the particles. So for a solid, they have strong forces of attraction. Now that's why they're held in a regular shape. That's why they can only vibrate. The forces stop the, the particles from moving away from each other. And they're held together by the forces. So they can only vibrate. They cannot move. In liquids, these forces of attraction are a bit weaker. Now that's why they can move around each other. That's why they're in an irregular shape. That's why when you pour a liquid, it would fill the shape of the, take the shape of the container that it, you pour it into. They're still close and touching though. It's not as if they're further or far away. So some people make a mistake when they draw a liquid, they draw it almost like a gas, the particles far away. When we throw a gas, these have got very weak forces of attraction. So that means that they're free to move around. And they, so because they're a gas, they have more energy, and that'll make more sense later on. But so they move around quite quickly. They're a lot quicker than our liquids that are moving around. And they move around in random directions, you would say. So let's look at our required practical. This is one of the ones you have to learn. It was on the 2018 summer exam paper um, last year. So quite an important one. Will it come up again um, for 2019? We're not sure, but it could come up in some shape or form. So what is it for? Finding the density of a regular object, a liquid, an irregular object. Now, say you're in your exam, you haven't done your revision, and you couldn't remember how to do this required practical. Where, where do we start? Well, we think of the formula, density is mass over volume. So, oh, right, so if I was talking about a regular object, now that could mean something like a cube, or it could be um, some, cylindrical, some cylindrical prism, um, or a sphere, or something like that, okay? Um, so, you got to think, well, I need mass. Well, how do you find mass? Or oh, I would weigh the shape. I would weigh the object using a mass balance, you'd say. Well, how do we get volume? Well, you should know how to find the volume of a cube. We would do base times the width times the height. Okay, length of the base times the width times the height. Um, and that, that would easily find your volume. And then to find the density, I would do... So you don't just say, then find density. You need to state clearly. I would find the density by doing mass divided by volume. And you show, show the equation. If it was for something like um, a cylindrical um, cylinder, um, you would have, a, you would find the area of the surface, which would be a, a circle there, so you do pi, pi r squared, and then you just times by the length of the cylinder. And if it was some other type of prism, like a triangle prism, you would do the area of whatever the face is. Um, I'd be unsure if they would ask you something like this, or a triangle prism, um, for your GCSE physics, um, unless perhaps they gave you some help with the, the finding the, find the volume. For irregular objects, that could be something like a statue, it could be something like piece of plasticine that you mold into a shape so you, if you're doing this in the classroom well how do we find the volume so we don't know how to find the volume like we did for our cube so what we use is something called a eureka can or a displacement can so a eureka can is where you fill it up with water right up until just below just below the nozzle here so if, it, if anything got put into it it's going to displace the water which is going to raise the level of water and then the water is going to come out of the side so what you do is you put the object inside your eureka can your funny shaped object you don't know the volume of the water is going to spill out and you would measure it in your measuring cylinder so you collect the water with a beaker or something and then you use a measuring cylinder okay so one milliliter on your measuring cylinder would be equal to one centimeter cubed 
you can easily find the volume of a weirdly shaped object or irregular shaped object using the measurement cylinder you really can um, and then you can obviously just find its mass using the mass balance again put it into the equation density is mass over volume you've got the density for a liquid all you need to do is measure the mass of the um, measurement cylinder without the liquid in it then measure it in with the with some liquid in it so you maybe put 10 or 20 milliliters in inside your inside your thing you've already got the volume because you've measured you've measured it you put 20 milliliters in you do density is mass divided by volume and you'd repeat that for several measurements you maybe do 20 milliliters 40 milliliters 60 milliliters and so on until you've got the density and take an average then to find the density of the liquid so the density of the liquid is quite easy but remember the eureka can for this irregular object So next we're going to look at internal energy. What do we mean by internal energy? It's the sum of kinetic energy stores of all the particles and the sum of all the potential energies of the particles in an object. So when we say kinetic energy, we could be talking about just a table. Okay, so we've got a table here, and we're talking about the internal energy of the particles inside this object. Well, obviously, well, this object is not moving. So we're not talking about the kinetic energy of the object. We're talking about the particles inside. So we said that if this was a solid, all the particles are vibrating they're in a fixed position but they're vibrating well that means they have kinetic energy because they're vibrating and obviously a liquid and a gas they're moving around so they have kinetic so they have more kinetic energy there when we say the potential energy well what do we mean we mean that if you have some in your particles if you've got atoms so if you think of your chemistry now so you think of like some ionic bonds or some covalent bonds of the molecule that they're held together. Well, that's potential energy. In the same thing, if we think of gravitational potential energy and topic one, well, that meant that the further something was away from the Earth, they would have more gravitational potential energy. Here, we're not talking about gravitational potential energy. We're talking about the energy between these things that are bonded together. So, for example, you could think that as these things are moving and rotating, these particles are moving, that you could think of these bonds as being like springs. And you could think of that potential energy as like a stretch as they get pulled apart. So as there's molecules moving around, they've got these bonds between the atoms, and then there's forces of attraction between the actual molecules themselves. These, all these things add up to the potential energy store of the particles. That's what we're actually referring to. If you add all the rest of this energy up, we've got the internal energy of the object. So what happens when we heat an object up? We're going to do one of two things. Either we're going to change the temperature, now, if we change the temperature, well, what does that actually mean? Well, if we're heating something, that means we're giving those particles energy. So they're going to, have, they're going to be moving around more. They're going to be vibrating more. So that means they're going to have more kinetic energy. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. So as the temperature rises, that means they've got more kinetic energy. You've got more heat in. They're moving around more. They're vibrating more. The temperature has increased. Well, what happens otherwise? Well, what may happen is that they may change state. So instead of putting energy into the kinetic energy of the particles, what you're doing is you're using energy to break or form bonds. You're affecting those forces of attraction. So let's go into this change of state a little bit more. So some rules, first of all, the number of particles is the same before and after a change of state. There's no, ch there's no difference, even if there appears to be, because the density might have changed, because um, we know that um, gases are less dense than liquids, and because the particles are further apart. So it may appear that there's a less particles, but it's actually the same. And the same thing is mass is conserved. So even if you've got a liquid going into a gas, mass is, um, mass is conserved in the change. So we've got our changes of state. We've got solid to a liquid. So we've got melt in there. When we heat an object, when we heat a, when we heat a solid like ice. When we've got a liquid going to a solid, we have freezing. So just think of ice and water every time with this to not get confused. If we've got a liquid to a gas, we've got boiling or evaporating. If we've got a gas to a liquid, we've got condensing. So it's like when um, steam condenses to water on a mirror, on a cold mirror. Well, what solid to a gas, we've got sublimation. Okay, so let's think of, something, think of something like dry ice for that. Now, there is a process that goes from gas to solid, but you don't need to know that about that. So you need to know the names of these changes of state and be able to link these states to the properties that we discussed earlier about where they're fixed, as they're vibrating or if they're moving, and so on. So we just said that when we heat an object or we change, we change, we're inputting or taking away energy from an, um, an object or a substance, that we could be changing the state. The specific latent heat is referring to the amount of energy that we're talking about when we're changing state. 
Now, what you've got to be really careful is, is not to get confused with the specific heat capacity, which we discussed in topic one. So the specific capacity can help us understand this. When we did specific heat capacity, we said E is how much energy you're putting into a substance of a particular mass. And we this here, that's delta theta here, was the change in temperature. So we said if you put energy in, you increase its temperature, you increase that average kinetic energy. And specific heat capacity was that C, that different substances have different Cs, which was for specific heat capacities, and they would require different amounts of energies for a different amount of temperature changes. And we talked about how something like a rock would have a very um, high specific heat capacity, you have to put loads of energy in to change its temperature, whereas some, sometimes the metal, metals would have a lower specific heat capacity, you won't have to put so much energy in to change its temperature. So that was a way of quantifying how much energy we need for a change in temperature. Specific latent heat is talking about, well, it's not change in, temp it's not change in temperature, it's change in state. And that's what these graphs are showing here. If we've got the temperature here, and we've got time here, or well, the amount of energy we're inputting. Okay, so say you are, here we've got um, heat in a substance, so this could be melting ice. So we start with some ice as a solid, we're inputting energy here, now it's change in temperature, it could be at minus 50 or whatever, you're increasing its temperature here. So we're increasing its temperature here, we're putting energy in, that means they're gaining kinetic energy, the internal energy of the substance of the ice is increasing, and that energy is going into that equation there, isn't it? That the specific heat capacity equation essentially, we're putting energy in to change its temperature. And then something weird starts to happen. We continue to put energy in, but now our temperature stays stable for a bit, it plateaus. So something must be going on here. Why is the temperature no increasing? So if we're talking about ice, this is obviously at zero degrees when it's melting into a, into water, into a liquid. So that we're still inputting energy, we're still heating the ice, but now we're no longer getting more kinetic energy. What's happening here? We must be breaking the bonds. That energy is not disappearing anyway. We must be using those energy to break down the bonds or to make the or to make the bonds weaker. Okay, we're breaking down those forces of attraction between the particles. Then what goes happen? Well, now well, we broke we broke down. It's changed state now. It's in a liquid. Now we go back to increasing the kinetic energy, internal energy of the substance and we're putting more energy in, which is changing the temperature until eventually we change state again. So when we talk about the specific latent heat, we're talking about well, how much energy are we using in these different situations. It's the same for when we're cooling something down as well. We're using energy here to end up forming bonds, okay? We're using energy here to form bonds, and that's why um, the temperature stops decreasing there. So what do we call this? Well, we've got two types of latent heat. So there's latent heat of fusion, which refers to how much energy is used to melt or freeze a substance. Well, we've also got latent heat of vaporization, which is to boil or condense a substance. So they, even if you talk about the same substance, say water, they have different values of latent heat. Latent heat of fusing, when you melt or freeze, or latent heat of vaporization. It doesn't matter, it's the same substance of water, they have different amounts of energy. So that's what this equation is for here. You are provided with this one in the exam, though it is one of the easier ones. So E is energy, which we should know is in joules. Mass is in kilograms. So let's rearrange this equation for latent heat. Well, how do we get that? These are M times L here. So if we do energy over mass, divide through by it, get it onto the other side, we've got L. So what's the units of latent heat? We've got joules per kilogram. Okay, so we have latent heat of fusion or latent heat of um, vaporization. So you'd have to be talking about the mass of the substance that you melted or the mass of the substance you've boiled. Now there is a prac that goes along with this. It is not a required prac, but it's definitely one I would be um, aware of. So it's very similar to the prac that was discussed on topic one for the specific heat capacity. It's all about putting energy in, but instead of changing temperature, we're now changing state. So you'd use one of these electric immersion heaters, that's this thing here, and we'd connect that up um, to a power pack and we'd get some ice. Now what you've got to be careful of is now you're, you don't want to be putting this NG in to increase the temperature. So this is, should be ice that's just about getting to zero degrees, it's not going to be deep frozen ice. And what we can do is we're going to measure how much heat energy we put in with our electric heater. So we're, we are assuming that all the electric energy we put in is converted to heat, and then we are also assuming that all of this energy, heat energy is going into the ice. We're also assuming that there's not heat in the room that's going to heat the ice. And what would happen is the ice is going to melt, and you could then measure the mass of the, melt, of the melted ice using the mass balance. Now we've got M. So we've got M here. 
in our equation for negative heat, trying to work out the latent heat of fusing for ice. So we've got mass. Now what we need now is energy. Well, how do we get the amount of energy we put in? We're assuming all the electrical energy is going into heat. Okay. Well, how do we measure the electrical energy? If you remember when we did this um, graph in topic one, what you need to measure is for electrical energy is I times V times T it's power i times v times time because this is power times time equals mg and power is i times v what is i have you done your electricity revision i is the current and v is the voltage or potential difference t is time in seconds we've got amps and um, volts and seconds there to work out how much energy you have we put in we assume that's 100 percent efficient and we assume that lots of that heat is not escaped into the room and then we've got how much energy is going to the ice and now we've got the mass, we can do energy divided by mass and we can get a value for the latent heat diffusion of ice. This is not a very accurate practice because of those problems that we just mentioned about the heat in being lost or the heat in the room going into the ice. Um, it does not work as well as this one, but you can get a half decent value. So it's not required practical, but I would definitely be aware of this one. Lastly, we're gonna look at the particle motion and pressure. So this is the part that's got some extra bits in it. If you do triple, that will be on a separate video. So we said earlier that the more kinetic energy something has, the higher the average kinetic energy, that would mean the higher temperature. Now let's think about what that actually means. We, we should know that from our topic one, the equation for kinetic energy, our kinetic energy store, is half times velocity squared. And the mass of the particles is the same, that's unchanged. So what's increasing? V, the speed, the velocity is increasing. So higher temperature substances means there's a higher speed in the um, in the particles. So that's what gives it that higher internal energy. Now, how is that linked to pressure? Now, pressure is all about collisions and all about the forces from those collisions. So you may remember um, from key stage three that pressure is force over area. Okay, so what do we actually mean by the pressure? Well, the pressure is due to the force of these particles. If we're talking about a container of gas, say, when these particles are all moving around and they are colliding with the walls of the container, and that is what is giving the pressure because it's the force they're exerting across the area of the container. So there's a net force at right angles to the container as they, as they collide with them. So how does that link to speed? We'll get onto in a second. Let's just think of, though, well, what if you had a different volume container? Let's if you say you had the same number of particles, the same amount of gas, but now you've got a bigger volume. What would happen to the pressure? Well, think about it. That's like saying if you had a room full of air and you compress that into a cylinder, like a scuba diving cylinder. Well, if it's compressed into a smaller volume here compared to the room here, which has got a bigger volume, what's happened to the pressure? Well, hopefully you think, oh, well, surely the pressure is a lot bigger than the smaller volume. If the gas has been compressed into a cylinder, the pressure is higher. But why is that pressure higher? Well, assuming the gas at the same temperature is moving around at the same speed, but now because it's, the volume is smaller compared to a large volume, they're going to collide with the walls more frequently. So there's more frequent collisions. That would give the higher pressure. Whereas in a bigger volume, they're still moving around the same speed, but now because the walls are further away, they're going to collide less frequently. That means the total force is less inside here because there's less collisions. Therefore, the pressure inside here would be less. Let's think about what else we can think of um, to do with this. We can think of, this is a quite famous example of the Magdeburg hemispheres. You can Google this or have a look at uh, some other videos about this on YouTube, Magdeburg hemispheres, they're quite cool things. So Magdeburg hemispheres are just um, a trick you can show to show the power of pressure. And all they do are two hollow metal hemispheres. So they're hollow. And what you would do is you can make these two hemispheres um, stick together and you wouldn't be, or you'd be very much struggle to separate them. And it's not as if you're putting super glue or anything inside them. All you're going to use is the power of the pressure, the force of the pressure. So what you do is you stick them together. And after you put them together, you get a vacuum pump. And what you do is they're full of air now, aren't they? Because you've stuck them together. And when you use the vacuum, you're going to suck out the air particles from inside. Now let's think about that. That means now you've got an area of very, very few particles on the inside compared to the air on the outside, which is full of air particles. Okay. Now let's think those air particles are all colliding with the outside 
of the hemisphere that exerted forces, exerted pressure on the outside. Now you've created a vacuum on the inside, which means there's no particles or very near no particles on the inside. So that means the pressure on the inside has gone. Well, if you've got rid of all the particles, it'd be zero. But let's say you've nearly got a perfect vacuum. There's a few particles in there. The pressure is now really, really low in there. So that bit large pressure on the outside, well, it's not it's not large, it's just so much bigger compared to, the, to the what's on the inside, is now it's what holds those hemispheres together and you wouldn't be able to separate them. And that difference in pressure makes it very difficult to separate. Um, what else can we think of? Well, let's think of a balloon. Well, how do you inhale them? Uh, how do you um, make a balloon go bigger? Well, you add more particles on the inside and you blow more air in. That means you add more particles on the inside. Now that means that there's more collisions, there's more force being exerted. That means there's a bigger pressure on the inside than on the outside. What happens to the balloon? The balloon inflates, okay? Until the pressures are the same. So, what about um, another thing, another example of this? What about the limit to temperature? So a good example of this is think of a table tennis ball. So think of like if you've got a crushed or damaged table tennis ball, how would you repair it? Well, one of the things you can do is like, you can get a lighter, put a lighter underneath it, or you can put it in hot water, okay? But if you put it in hot water, those particles inside the table tennis ball are going to get hotter. Well, let's think, what does that actually mean? Well, that means they're going to have a higher average kinetic energy because they're at a higher temperature. But what does that mean? Well, that means they're traveling at a faster speed. So if we're thinking inside this uh, table tennis ball, now these particles are now moving with a faster speed inside the, the ball. You haven't added any more particles inside, they've just got a faster speed, they've got more kinetic energy. Well, that means they're going to hit the walls harder with a larger force. They're going to hit a larger force because they're traveling faster. It also means there's more collisions. Well, what does this mean? There's going to be a larger pressure inside the table tennis ball. So say it was damaged on the outside, the pressure would now be bigger on the inside than on the outside, and that would force the table tennis ball the walls of the table tennis ball outwards, which would repair the table tennis ball. So you're using pressure. So every single time, all these examples we've talked about, you're thinking about the kinetic energy of the particles, the collisions, the frequency of the collisions, and you're constantly referring to the force that they exert on the walls or whatever it is.